for anybody who hasn't been here, uh, we've been talking quite a long time about what these relationships are. Um, it's a little hard to explain, um, but it's kind of getting, um, I think it's getting a little easier for me, but uh, let's just kind of start from the beginning and we'll work from there. Uh, like do the doctor was mentioning earlier, there is a relationship between the books of Jude and Second Peter. Um, Scholars have long noted this. A lot of times when you go and you get commentaries and stuff like that, you'll see that they'll often put Jude together with Zach and Peter. A um, couple of things. Um, when, you, when, you read a, um, when you read a book uh, in the Bible, or you read anything anywhere really, um, if there's certain kinds of questions, or certain kinds of answers that are given, certain kinds of data that the writer of the letter is providing, they oftentimes will, will um, provide insights into the sort of questions and issues um, that uh, that were being that were in the air, if you will, or that were uh, you know sort of floating around at the time. There, there are a couple of things that Jude is known for. First of all, so this is something that's more or less accepted by scholars and Christians alike that Jude does quote outside of the canon. There is sort of the question as to whether or not. Uh, the canon is something that uh, the Bible even um, speaks of. Like, uh, there's really no such thing as a canon list or something within the Bible. So it's something of a human concept. And that's evidenced by the fact that, number one, there's no set canon among all Christians. There's no universal agreement. You've got Orthodox Church has theirs, Catholic Church has theirs, Protestant Church has theirs, and so right. on and so forth. Right. And so there's just a huge multiplicity. So logic would tell you that there's that obviously they can't all be right because you know they're including some and excluding others, right? And so that there's sort of a line of demarcation over here on this side you can read this stuff and over here on that side you can't read this stuff. Well, there's a couple of things that Jude quotes at least two other sources that we know for sure. One of them is called the Assumption of Moses. Okay, and the other one is of course the Book of Enoch. Right. So, a couple of things. Um, is this just some sort of offhanded remark? Is this just something like if I quote, you know, pop culture or something, am I invoking inspiration? Right. Is this just something he says in, in passing because it's common knowledge and everybody just sort of knows it? It's a touchstone or whatever. Or does he is he implying that this is scripture? Right. There's a couple of things. Number one. The, most, the easiest one to look at, of course, is the Book of Enoch, because number one, he names him by he names the source actually by name. It says in Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, right? So this right. is the second data point that he gives us that he's the seventh from Adam. So this gives us his antiquity. Okay, um, and then, then of course this is the source. Yeah, I want to make a mention real quick of something. Uh -huh. Second Peter also references and quotes from Enoch, but he doesn't cite his source. Right. But if you know the book of Enoch, you read what he's saying. It's obvious. Just like I was talking about in Hebrews chapter 11, the roll call of the faithful, it quotes from 2 Maccabees. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say, oh, this citation is from 2 Maccabees. But if you read 2 Maccabees chapter 7, you realize that the writer of the epistle of Hebrews is quoting from 2 Maccabees without doubt. So. Right. right. So, but just a, few, just a few data points, though. So, so number one, he's quoting the name of the source. A person might ask why. Right. right, he's calling him the seventh from Adam. Right, so somebody might be questioning why. Why is it, why do we have this datum? Right, um, that he prophesied. Right, right about these men. Right, so in other words, he's a prophet. <coughs> right, <coughs> that he prophesied about the men who will in, who were infiltrating the church. So not only was he a prophet up to the time of the flood. Right, but he's also a prophet up to the time of Jude's church, right? Because he prophesied of these men who were infiltrating the church. So his prophecy bears on his age. And what is the prophecy that he that he cites? He says that behold, the Lord cometh with the ten thousands of his saints. Uh, all that. So you know, all, you know that quote, right? But because it, it's a big, long, lengthy quote, right? And so functionally, what that tells us is that you've got Jude saying, you know this over here, and then you've got Enoch saying this over here. So you can check and see that this, what he, what Jude says, is equal to what, what, 
what Enoch says, right? So there's a couple of things that you can glean from this. He, he makes sure, you know, he, he, he dots his I's and crosses his T's, so to speak, in this statement because he's staying quite a mouthful here, right? If, why would he be citing his antiquity unless there was some question about it? Is this book old, right? Why would he be underscoring his antiquity, right? If, um, you know, there wasn't some question about that. This book is not ancient, right? This book did not come from Enoch, right? Uh, this book is not prophecy, right? You can easily see people saying that because they say that today. In fact, Enoch is classified as a pseudepigraphon, which means it's a false writing, at least in the eyes of scholars. That's why they slapped that name on there. So the presumption is that it's a, that it's a, a false prophecy. But we know that from the data point that we have from Enoch 14 and 15, right, that he is citing the source, he is underscoring the its antiquity, he is saying that it's prophetic, and he is telling you that the text that you have, right, is the same text that he has, right? So you know that you've got that book, and that book is ancient, probably, at least as far as Jude is concerned, right? Right. Whether or not people think that's the case, that's another story. But that's, again, but that's just to underscore that there's a line of demarcation being law, drawn between what the apostles apparently believed and what men have taught about this, this book and its importance, right? There's a difference. So, I mean, this is something that is objective, and this is the strength of this argument, is that it's literary. Like, if you, you, can, you can bring this before a Muslim, you can bring this before an atheist, you can bring it before anybody. As long as they're able to read those words, they can come to those conclusions, right? So... The question would be, why in the world was, does Second Peter have so many parallels with Jude? If you check the, um, everybody here should have that um, Second Peter and Jude parallels. If, they, if anybody doesn't have that book, if you just don't have it even today, I've got plenty of them on the table over there. You can grab yourself one. But it's important to understand. Okay, so now you have something kind of interesting, and this is this is this is fascinating to me because this is all New Testament canon. And these two books exist in basically everybody's canon. I know there's people like in Syriac Church or something, they tend to discount these books, but they're still in their Bible. They never were formally canonized. You know, there's questions that people have about the authenticity of these books. Don't get me wrong. But to a believer, they're in the canon. They are God's word. They are to be taken seriously. And it's, it's interesting that, that we have the force of the canon behind these books, right? Because now that we have the force of the canon behind Jude, and Peter seems to draw from Jude and write around Jude. If there were questions about the propriety of reading Enoch, and it's important to understand that Enoch doesn't, that Jude doesn't just quote Enoch. He also quotes the assumption of Moses when he talks about the, um, the Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil. He disputed about the body of Moses, right? Durst not bring a railing against, accusation against the devil. You know what I'm saying? So he makes that statement, but that's from a non-canonical source, right? And Enoch, this particular quote, 13 and 14, these are not the only allusions in you find in Jude. You talk about um, Jude 6. He talks about the chains, right? These The angels were delivered into chains, right? So that's the same as Enoch, I believe it is 54, right? Because that very specific data point here that it's chains is also found in the book of Enoch. He talks about the mist of darkness in, in verse 13, just before this statement, right? And uh, again, um, the book of Enoch talks about them being in, um, you know, in, in space and in, 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 right. and in darkness. Just so you people, if you don't understand, so the book of Enoch, and this is probably the reason why it's controversial, it has this, it's, good, it's kind of an expansion on Genesis chapter 6, right? Where it says, the sons of God beheld the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took wives among whoever they chose. So Enoch is saying that this is an order, the sons of God are an order of angels called the Watchers. Or, yeah, the holy, there's different orders of angels, right? The archangels, cherubim, seraphim. So you have this order of angels called the Watchers. I think the angel talks about a, a holy watcher. But out of this order of angels, certain angels fell, and they, not just, you don't even have just the sexual sin and the introduction of the Nephilim, they also corrupt mankind by teaching people to do wicked things like go to war and right. prostitution, stuff like that. So these Nephilim oppress mankind and they shed blood. The giants, right? The men of renown. But, but in, the, in the book of Enoch, they're like monstrous. And so there's basically a heavenly battle where Michael and 
Gabriel and Raphael, these divine angels, wage a spiritual warfare against the fallen angels, including Samyaza and Azazel. And Azazel is actually mentioned in the Torah uh, as the scapegoat. Um, so these, these angels that, that, that compel people to sin are thrown into the, the abyss, right? In chains of darkness and mist. And this seems to be different from Satan and his angels because where's Satan at? Well, he's as like a roar, roaring lion seeking he may devour. But these angels that sin yes. and corrupted mankind in a, a distinctly different way, they're in, uh, it talks about in Second Peter, Tartarus, which is uh, a, a place in hell where these fallen angels, uh, I guess in, in Greek mythology, Tartarus was used for where the Titans were, you know, a place in hell where they were confined and, and tormented. It's like the deepest bit of hell. So that's what, when it's talking about chains and mist of darkness, that's what it's talking about, is the nature of these fallen angels and how they sin. And one more thing, I'll show you. I'm sorry to interrupt. But the, the prophecy, right, the prophecy is um, about judgment, right? The whole the Lord will come to execute judgment. And that's a big theme of the book of Enoch. So, sorry. Okay. No, that's good. So, that, I mean, but, okay, but that's that's sort of the interesting thing about it because it is about judgment. And this is this all plays into how judgment comes about and just how it is that he has got things for us to come to understand at the end times to bring us to the original understanding that the apostles had. Because it, uh, it just is manifestly by his usage, by his, ta his, his citation of the source, he's not ashamed to speak it, right? His designation of its antiquity, evidently Jude believes it's ancient. Evidently Jude believes it's prophetic. He makes an appeal to the prophet, to the apostles. He says, these are the things that your apostles taught you, right? And so what you can see is that apparently the letter of Jude is brought before Peter. Okay. Presumably there are certain questions that they had that are related to the questions they had before. What is the propriety of using the source? Is this, is this source really ancient? Do you really believe this, right? Is he really a prophet? Right? Should we be reading this book? Right? Right, right, right? He answers this question in a couple of ways. In a couple of ways, because again, if you answer a question, it implies if you if you if you answer if you give an answer, it implies the question. So one of the questions he says, one of the questions he answers is, we did not call we did not follow cleverly concocted fables when we talked to you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? So what does the quote here say? Behold, the Lord cometh, cometh, right? So that's the coming, right? With ten thousands of the saints to execute judgment. Okay, so we talk about judgment, right? Right? So, but this is the power, right? And this is the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when he says that we did not follow cleverly concocted fables, he's saying basically Enoch is not a cleverly concocted fable. In other words, it's not a pseudepigraphon. Right. This is real. Right. right? That's his right. assertion. Right? So when he told you about behold the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment, he was not just quoting a fable. He was quoting something that was ancient and prophetic bore on his age and bore on the age to come it's behold the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints that that has to do with the ending well how does that dovetail with Enoch first of all just parenthetically one of the things that Enoch says about himself if anybody's read this book the very first thing it says is that so it starts out the words of the blessing of Enoch wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous who will be living in the day of tribulation when the wicked and the godless are to be removed. And he took up his parable and said, Enoch, a righteous man whose eyes were opened by God, saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens, which the angels showed me. And from them I heard everything, and from them I understood as I saw. But not for this generation, but for a remote one, which is for to come. Concerning the elect, I said, and took up my parable concerning them. So this new name that we're going to get, that's the elect. Right? When he talks about this in Revelation, Amen. we'll be given a new name. We will be given a stone. A stone, again, is a testament. Turn these stones into bread, right? Make them readable. Right. Make them digestible. Because our spiritual food is the scripture. Right. So anyway, so the idea is that, okay, so with his answer, 
he reveals that they had questions about the authenticity of this book. Is this book a cleverly concocted fable? No. When we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord, it was not a cleverly concocted fable. So he answers that question, right? And another question he talks about, and it's in the handout too if anybody has it, his usage of the word of old. In fact, both of their usage of the word of old is very interesting because when Peter talks about the world of old, it was, it was destroyed by the flood. The world of old was destroyed. So this term of old is a code word for the antediluvian world. Okay, so when he says of old, uh, right? If, if somebody what he doesn't means know, antediluvian means anti is before diluvian means the deluge. Yeah, the, the pre-flood flood world. Before the flood of Noah. Yeah, the pre-flood world. So when he says, for example, the world of old was destroyed by the flood, when he further says that prophets of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so in other words, well, okay, but was Enoch an antediluvian prophet? No. He was before the flood. Yes, right? He was the seventh from Adam. So when he says prophets of old, what's he talking about? He's talking about Enoch. Yes. Right? Right. Clearly talking about that. Right? So, so this has been left in store for, uh, for people to discern at the end of the age. See, when Enoch says it's not for his time, it means he's going to be taken out of circulation. He's going to be, it even sort of hints at this if you read the book of Enoch parabolically like it tells you to. You know, that Enoch was hidden. You know, his activities had to do with the watchers. You know, the people, he was sort of off on his own, and the people didn't see him, and he would show up every once in a while. You know what I'm saying? But he was sort of off to himself. It sort of implies that. You know, you understand that he, as a prophet or whatever, was doing other things or whatever, but it just sort of underscores the fact that he was hidden, right? So this book, because this is canonical, and Christians cannot deny this book, Right? right? And this is canonical, and Christians cannot deny this book. Right? You have one, two witnesses. Right? right? But if you bring in what Jesus is saying to the seven churches, and you see those relationships, like what does he talk about? The day star, the morning star. When the day dawns, right? And a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years are as a day. He tells us this himself, right? That a thousand year day is, you know, there's seven thousand years, right? right. Six thousand years, it says that Barnabas are given over to men. One thousand years or whatever, we reign with God. So that's the, that's the, we reign as kings and priests, right? So at the early part of that day, or the early part of the seventh century anywhere, which is where we are in time, right? We will be given the morning star in our hearts. On that day, right? So in the Revelation where he talks about to him who overcomes, um, yeah, in uh, Revelation 1, I'm sorry, 2, 28. Uh, okay, well, 26 through 28, I'll just read the whole thing. He who overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, right? So number one, if this stuff... If this, all of this information is contained in these books that we've had all along, in other words, it's been a light shining in a dark place, in other words, we count this age as an age of darkness, this has been shining that whole time, which is exactly why he says it's as a light that shines in a dark place, right? But then the morning star, of course, arises in our heart, so the dark place is the heart, right? That is, is awoken, if you will, on the seventh day early on, again, which is where we are in time, right? And it arises in our hearts. And then, of course, you can see all that stuff, which was there all along. And it's canonical. So I will give you a mouth and a wisdom that no one would be able to deny or to, yeah. to gainsay. Right? So you have that. So that's a given at this point. And then in Revelation, where he says, And he who overcometh and keepeth my works until the end, uh, again, I will give them power over the nations. Because, again, you can go to those people and say, Hey, church, all the stuff that you guys set up, it's all based on the canon. It's all based on what you taught. It's, it's all false. It's all false. Right? It's all based on your consensus. It's all based on a consensus reality rather than the reality that is actually there. Right? So you've denied this teaching 
by teaching something else this whole time. But here it is, I can pluck you up by the roots. Again, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Judaism gone, Christianity gone, right? And a new Jerusalem comes down from heaven, right? The day dawns, right, and it arises in our hearts. That we are given, the T Peter speaks of a divine nature that will be given, right? Right, and that that would be the transcendence to, to know that there is a God because you can see that He did this to understand to be able to look at that and say that is definitely a divine act. He knows how to keep the wicked right in their place and hold them until the day of judgment, the seventh millennium. Right, so He says this, he's, all of these things that He's saying in Peter are corroborated by this understanding and this insight. And to see that, okay, people didn't believe Jude. They thought he was, he was wrong. People didn't believe Peter, apparently, because this whole teaching was lost and his entire defense was subverted, right? So it's important when you see in the, in the seven letters of Revelation, right, that Yeshua picks up on a lot of these things that he's talking about in Second Peter and Jude. So now you have the witness of his brother, you have the witness of his chief apostle, and if you add revelation, you have the witness of him himself, right? So all of those people who denied Jude and denied Peter and ultimately denied Yeshua have gone as far as to deny our Lord. You see what I'm saying? And those are the assertions that are made in 2 Peter and Jude. And remember, Jude would have been first, right? Peter would have been next, and of course, um, Jesus, Yeshua, um, is the third witness so in in the uh you know you know what i'm saying in the in the eyes of two or three witnesses shall all things be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses right so we have not two but three witnesses right. and they are none other than the brother of our lord uh -huh. the chief apostle of our lord and the apostle uh -huh. the yeshua himself right uh -huh. so these are our these are the people who are telling us this story right, right? There is, a, there is a problem that's going on with the apostles all the way from the beginning. Remember the book of Revelation talks about that, um, that, that, that they will be given a, a mouth to speak lies and to overcome the uh, saints and to destroy them and to kill them, right? So all of this teaching uh, manifestly was lost because it was always there. It was always written, but it was, uh, it was again, it was the light shining in the dark place. The dark place was this age. The days of darkness, right? Um, that's where we are on the timetable. Um, sorry to skip around so much. It's a lot to try to pack into one little speech. Uh, but you kind of get the gist of this, right? So, again, when he says that I will be he who overcomes, I will give the morning star, right? It says, that he, okay, let me, let me make the point I was trying to make. So he that overcomes, keep my works to the end, I will give him power over the nations. You can see that, right? Because now you have authority. You have the authority of the canon. Right to uh, to upset the Christian apple cart, if you will. That's been basically going on uh, all this time. And he says, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of potter shall uh, of potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I have received of my Father. And again, because again, Christianity is destroyed by that, yes. absolutely destroyed. I mean, that doesn't say that you're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It's just that all of the false teachings you can see through them. You become transcendent of that concept that they foisted upon the church. Because again, the canon, the canon itself, like I, I pointed out before, it's kind of a box. It's just kind of a box of books, right? And so when somebody like Jude quotes outside of that, right? You know, let's say you have a, a reference here and you have a reference there, right? Of this other book, right? Why isn't this book here? Why isn't it in the canon, right? It's because you have this barrier of your thought. And this is something that Revelation gets into, the arts of the devil, the, the deception, very subtle, right? And this is why Judas, for example, was, was a, a betrayed Yeshua with a kiss and with a blessing. You know, blessings, my Lord, right? Let me kiss you, right? Because the Judases are the people who are saying, oh, these books, they're not ancient, right? They're not prophetic, right? Come on, right? They are, um, they are pseudepigraphal. Right. They are fables. Right. They're cleverly concocted or whatever, right. but they're not ancient. They're not prophetic. 
you know, his usage of that, how many times have you read that footnote, right? You know, his usage of it does not imply that it was inspired or any of that. You know what I'm saying? So they're casting doubts in your mind. And so the thing about it is when you go and you negate the Holy Spirit, because again, he mentions the Holy Spirit, that he's basically saying that Enoch spoke by the Holy Spirit, that he was a, that he was a prophet and he was divinely inspired, Right? The prophets of old, the prophets of the antediluvian times, spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Pray in the Holy Spirit, it says. You see what I'm saying? It's just this constant urging for you to transcend this barrier and understand that it's not yes and no, that God is just yes. You see what I'm saying? And this is why Paul kind of underscores that fact for us. So... I know that's a lot to take in. But so now take all that knowledge and sort of now we have to interface it with revelation. How does it all fit into the plan? Well, again, that's quite a lot to try and take on in, you know, five or ten minutes. But I wanted to talk today about overcoming, right? Uh, uh. One of the first things that you kind of have to understand is that there's a sequence to all of this. There's a, the, the, this is not my theory. This is something I've seen other people say, but it's just something that rings true and makes sense and provides a, a decent framework for understanding what the seven churches actually are. Because, again, we were talking about it last week, um, how Peter and Jude were somewhere in the 60s, maybe 60 to 65 A.D., Right. Okay. Revelation. <coughs> Maybe 90 to 100. Right. So clearly this antedates that if you just take it at face value. I mean, there are people who question it. There's people out there who say that Peter was a later forgery and stuff. But again, those are the same people who say that mm -hmm. Jude, that Jude is basically not yes. telling you the truth or whatever. So I mean, it's just the same group of people. Um, the idea is that the seven churches represent seven stages of the church age. And they're more or less in order, but there is some overlap. Um, first church, of course, is the church of the Ephesians, right? Second church, of course, is um, the church of the um, Smyrnians, right? Um, and then there's the, um, the, what is it, the, the, no, is um, Pergamos. Pergamos, that's right. Yeah, I don't know why I'm it's saying the first there. couple of chapters of the book of Revelation. Pergamos, so you can read yeah, and then Thyatira, and of course um, Sardis, um, no. then um, Philadelphia, Laodicea. and then Laodicea. And there's a couple of things that you'll see. Um, there's a little bit of um, there's a little bit of um, how should I say? Um, overlap here between these churches here and these churches here. And let me start with this one first because it's the easiest to illustrate. Um, he says to the church of Philadelphia, and, and there's a couple of things to mention here too. Let me, let me preface this by saying all of these churches have a rebuke, right? Uh -huh. Except for the church of the Smyrnians, right? Uh -huh. And he not only doesn't rebuke them, he uses the word crown, right? You know, right. be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown. Of life, so that crown is symbolic of victory, right? right? And then at the at the end of Philadelphia, he says, "Let no man take your crown." Right. So these are the two churches that don't have a rebuke because they have overcome, right. they have conquered, right. right? Don't don't let them take that. You got it, right? Uh -huh. The idea is that these people coexist with the early church, and these people coexist with the final church, the church of the Laodiceans, right? These, this represents sort of the formative church, right? The sort of the pre-canon church, where the, the, the canon was still forming, Christianity was still coalescing into something formal and religious and accepted, and it was, it's finding its way into society and, and into its final, you know, its more or less final form. And that morphs into the Catholic slash Orthodox church here in Thyatira, right? Um, and then that eventually morphs into the Protestant church, which is symbolized by Sardis, right? And then comes the 
church over here that has the same understanding as the early church. So I will make the last like the first. Many who are last will be first, right? right. Um, and this is why the book of Second uh, uh, Peter, especially, but Jude also, it talks about, Peter says, uh, to those of you who have come to a like faith as us, right, early on, well, here, really, um, you know, back in the 60s, right? Those of you who come to an early, uh, to a like understanding, a like faith as us, right? right? So in other words, these people hearken back to Jude's time, right? Because they have come to that like understanding, right? And so we saw what he was pitching now, but we didn't see that that was what he was pitching because we were catching something else, right? Because we were taught by these guys. <coughs> these guys were our teachers. You see what I'm saying? Those were the people who taught us. And this was the time of falling away. This is a time of forgetting, right? Whereas this was a time that was forgotten, right? Because the people, these guys lost their first love, right? Which was what? Well, one, one of the things you read about in, in Jude and in Second Peter a lot is he says things like knowing this first, right? Uh, above all, you must understand. So he's talking about absolutes, above all, first of all, those kinds of things. And then it's always in context with these books, right? So what they did was they lost their love of these books and that knowledge, right? Um, knowledge and interest and interest in these books. They lost their love, in other words, right? Their, their love waxed cold. Whereas these guys, these guys were killed, right? They were, they were wiped out, right? And this sort of spills over into this. You see about Antipas with my faithful martyr or whatever. So again, this was again a time of formation, right? A time where the, the knowledge was lost and the people who did have it were dying because of it. Because again, it was given power for them to overcome the saints, right? And so here we talk about, okay, so now we're in the church of Thyatira, right? Where we're eating food sacrificed to idols, and um, getting into sexual immorality, right? Because of that wicked teacher Jezebel, which again is basically the way in which the, the great whore of Babylon interfaces with the church. Because there's worldly Babylon and there's churchly Babylon, if you will. Yes, sir. Um, and so the idea is what is food and what is sexual immorality? That's, a, that's another mouthful here. The idea is that our spiritual food is the Word of God. So when you eat the Word of God, but it's sacrificed to an idol of the canon, let's say, right? Or the idol of their teaching, because their teachings are basically idol teachings, so to speak, in more ways than one, right? The idea is now that you have this prison, if you will, you have the word sort of um, chained up, if you will, boxed up, where it's like you only read what's in here and everything outside of that is off limits, right? Yes, sir. So now, you know, if it quotes out here, you have to deny it. Right? And so this is sort of a mind trick that's played on you. It's sort of a satanic art, the de deception, right? So this is why you see the satanic arc in here. You see the synagogue of Satan, those who say they are Jews but are not, right? Because they, they invoke the same thing that the Jews had, right? They had a canon, and then the canon was reintroduced. And so it, it brought you back into that same trap, that same mind trap, that same delusion if you will, right? And then it says, okay, so I will kill her, your children with death, or her children, the Jezebel, right? So when it starts out with the church of Sardis, it says, you know, uh, you have a reputation that you are alive, but you are dead, right? That's because they are their children, right? The children of the fault, the, the canonization, the, ch the children of the idea that, the, that there's some sort of authority, top-down kind of stuff, rather than bottom-up kind of stuff. You know, out, you know, outside in rather than inside out. Like, what is, like inside out reading would be like, okay, so he's quoting Enoch, therefore Enoch is valid. Outside in is like, no, Enoch is not valid. You stay in here, right? So the idea is that this is very subtle, but again, that's what we learned about the serpent, you know, from the old time was that he was very subtle. In fact, one of the more interesting things is what, how did, what does this really boil down to? Yea, hath God said, right? Huh? What? It's the most fundamental lie. Yea, hath God said. Right. But we can answer, yea, God hath said. Right. right. We can invert that. 
right. we can reverse that. Right. And it's through that reversal right. that we can do away with all of this, recover all of that, right? right? And then teach it to the ambivalent, right. to the people who don't care, right. people that we're surrounded by now. I mean, now that we've gotten past the millennium, right, Christianity's lost a lot of its influence. Those of us who grew up in the previous century knew that, that Christianity was kind of a strong block, a voting block, a, you know, a block of influence. You know, TV was afraid to put things on because of us. You know what I'm saying? And now there's really no fear of that, right? Because nobody cares. There's no power. There's no force in it. Now that 2000's coming on, everybody's just the same way. Where is the power? Where is this coming, right? You know, ever since, you know, the father's passed or whatever, everything's just going on just the same as it has forever and ever and ever. Right. And now the Satan is bold, right? But what does he say? He says to the Philadelphians, he talks about something very interesting here, and I'll have to close with that. Um, I hope to get a little bit further, but, um, you know, it is what it is. I, anybody who's here, you've got to get caught up, so we got to do this all the way from the beginning. Um, but that being said, what he says to the church of the Philadelphians is, um, yeah, he says to them, to the church of Philadelphia, right? These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David. Um, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Again, this, uh, this was shut to us, and now it's open to us, right? You can see the scriptures of the door, right? So that's why he says, that's why he goes on to say, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. So they got the door, and it's open, uh, right? Uh, so they have the open door. Right. Um, it says, and uh, no man can shut it, uh, right? Because right. now the cat's out of the bag. Right. It's out there to be seen. It's out there to be known. It's out there to change people's perception. Right, right, and right, it, and right. It, it, there's, you can see the function of it to, to destroy all that came before it and replace it with the actual truth that was destroyed at first. So the people who overcome came us then get to be overcome, right? Remember we talked about the, the Nicolaitans, right? <coughs> Bringing that up. Nicolaitans, we talked about that. Nico means um, overcome. Or to conquer, right? And then Laetans, right? That is the laity. Right. Right? So overcoming the people, right? So he who overcomes is overcoming the overcomers. Right. Those those guys. Right, right. right. So you right. see how it all lays out, right? That's why you got right. the power, because it's so easy to show once you sort of get it, yeah. right? Once you sort of understand it. That's what they fought so hard to keep us from understanding. They had reason to, right. because the devil could buy himself 2,000 more years if he did this, right? As before, so again, they had a cannon before, so now they have again. So speaking of that open door, again, the scriptures of the door, opening up the scriptures, opening up the door. Behold, I have placed before you an open door. In other words, it's manifestly visible to you. You obviously see it. You obviously know it. Right? I've set you before you an open door. No man can shut it. For thou hast had a little strength, and hast kept my word, and has not denied my name. Right? But I mean, again, I've said this before. How hard is it to just agree with Jude? How much faith does it take? It's faith of a mustard seed, right? Jude says he's ancient. You can say he's ancient. Right. Little strength. Not a great right. deal of strength. Just a tiny, tiny bit of strength. Right? He says that he's prophetic. He's a prophet. Right? If you say he's a prophet, how, how hard is that? Right? These guys actually have it easy. In fact, he kind of goes on to say, look, I'm going to make it easy for you. I'm going to keep you from the time of the trial. I'm going to keep you from the time of, of the, the destruction here. Right? That shall come upon the whole earth. Right? Kind of as a promise. Right? Because they're right here at the end of all of this with the open door. Right? And so what does he say to the, to the Laodiceans, who are the people who basically don't care? He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anybody hears my voice, in other words, if anybody understands my secret language, if you hear, if whoever has eyes to see, ears to hear, whoever has ears to hear, hears my voice, in other words, right? let them hear. So he's giving us permission to listen to this stuff given us he's actually telling us to actually but so in other words he says behold I stand at the door and knock if any man hears my voice right in other words they understand the teaching right, right. the voice which is again the higher level meaning the spiritual meaning right, right. Um, and it says um, I will come into him right again he's the morning star he will enter their heart 
Right. Right, right. I will come into him and will sup with him. Again, what is our spiritual food? Right. 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 I mean, obviously the scriptures, but also Enoch and everything that the yes, scriptures sir. quote. Yes, and basically he's opening up that whole door right. for us to escape. Um, and it says, to him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. In other words, we will come to rest and then we come to reign. Okay, because you found the answer, so you don't have to be looking for it anymore. And because you have the answer given to you, you have the power to reign. Yes. Right? Right. Um, and he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And if, like I said, if you really want to go full throttle with this, the door, the door, and what happens here is in the, here, there's a door in heaven. Uh. Right? And so that's kind of that's kind of once we overcome and and destroy what the overcomers did to the church we talked about diatrophies triatrophies for example in um last week um and I'll, I'll mention this just in brief and then i'll have to cut it um he's uh, in john third john verse 13 forward it says i had um i'm sorry no 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 Oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong place. Uh, in, in starting in verse 9, 3 yes. John verse 9, it says, I wrote unto the churches, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receivest us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth. Um, okay, so again, just real quick. Diotrephes. Right, um, he who feeds Jupiter, right? Um, he loves to have the preeminence. He kind of fits the description of the people that Jude and, and Peter talk about too. If you read that Jude, you talk about how much it obviously he dislikes these people, right? He loves to have the preeminence. What else does he do? He prates against, he prates against. Against who? Against John and the disciples, right? The beloved disciple. You know, here's a man who's so proud, right, that he actually has the nerve to pray against John and his followers, right? And uh, and he he wrote. John actually wrote them a letter, right? Right. He wrote a letter, but Diotrephes wouldn't let them read that letter, right? And then it says, um, he, he prays against them with malicious words, and he's not content with that. He does not receive the brethren, and he forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. So he casts out based on what? Based on whether they are John's disciples or not, right? So these are your Nicolaitans. These are the people who are overcoming the laity, right? So that's kind of the basic wow. foothold that you got to have in order to understand the book of Revelation. <coughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to make one more comment, and then we'll transition to worship, the worship service. I got this book. It's kind of interesting. It's called uh, First Enoch is Christian Scripture, and it's written by an Ethiopian Christian. Because uh, in Ethiopia, uh, it's one of the oldest branches of Christianity in the world. They always, they never, they, they're the ones who preserve Enoch in its entirety. It's part of the Bible. So he shows in this book how that the writers of the New Testament used Enoch as scripture. And then the early church fathers used, the, the apostolic fathers, the first generation of Christians after the apostles used Enoch as scripture. Then the early church fathers <coughs> used Enoch as scripture. Then... With Augustine, it started being suppressed, but not in Ethiopia, where it's part of the Bible. So this is ex explained perspective of a Christian denomination, an ancient Christian denomination, where Enoch is always held as scripture. So, a lot of people, and in the, in the Protestant, I'm gonna, I'll do this real quick. Among Protestants, let's just say here you have your zero, your 500, your 1,000, then we have 1,500, right? And then today's, you know, after 2,000. And a lot of Christians, evangelicals, seem to look at 
Well, when's the last apostle? Maybe 100, year 100, and then we ignore, you know, almost over a thousand years of church history until we get to Martin Luther, right? For a lot of Protestants, that's like we had this big dark age of the church, and then, you know, that's what, how a lot of Protestants look at it. Oh, it's just this big mess, and then Martin Luther came and set things right, right? But the interesting thing is, Christianity started off, it started branching, branching off, right, to different forms. You have Latin Christianity, which is the Western form of Christianity. You have Greek Christianity. So we're familiar with these two. This would be Catholicism and Greek Orthodoxy, right? But Christia, uh, Christianity also went to the Syriac or the Aramaic tradition. And then we have the Coptic and Ethiopic tradition. These are African, right? Ethiopic. So... We tend to, to, okay, Protestants tend to ignore all the church history and, and start with uh, Martin Luther. And uh, those who look at all of church history, they, they tend to ignore these communities, even though this community is the one that you know, uses the language Jesus spoke, they ignore them, ignore Egyptian. We're just not familiar with it, right? Now, recently there's been trends where they're looking at, at, at uh, these ancient, other ancient uh, Christian traditions. But... One thing that happened, let's look at the Latin tradition. Around the year 400, we have uh, St. Jerome, right? So Jerome translates the Bible into the Latin Vulgate. Actually, it's, it's, it's similar to the King James Bible, honestly. It's just in Latin. So, uh, but what happened is people didn't speak Latin anymore, and the Catholic Church came to a, a, a state where they liked that. They liked that, right? Speaking because... Of they withheld the Bible. They withheld the Bible from the masses. Right. Right. So the Bible's in Latin. We don't want it translated. We'll tell you what it says. If you have any questions, and in fact, most people were unfamiliar with the Bible, and a lot of the Bible stories they were more familiar with well, was the Gold Legend. Right. This is a book of legends of the saints, and, and 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 the writer of this collection of the lives of saints, like I don't know Saint Jerome, I don't know Saint Catherine. This guy wrote this book about you know, different saints, and he included some Bible stories in there. And that was as much familiarity with the Bible a lot of people had. Yes, because the Catholic Church, okay, Latin, the intent of Jerome was for everybody to have access to the Bible. Right. But then Latin dies out as a language, all these vernaculars, and the Catholic Church is like, okay, this is good for us. We can keep people in ignorance. Right? We, we hold the Bible, and the people can't. And like I said, people don't even know the Bible. So... What did Martin Luther do? Did now, they really want to keep the people in ignorance, or were they just so high minded they thought that it couldn't be trusted to the to the people to, to interpret it? I properly? think that's that's part of it. They're yeah. afraid. Well, if people have access to the Bible, they'll misinterpret it. We want to control access to Scripture. Uh, it was a type of uh, there were a, some a, a inner pride, a type yeah. of you know holier than thou kind I, of. I, I do have to say, been elites. Yeah. Right. There, there are, can't be trusted to the masses because they. I don't know what they're talking There's about. There's actually good Catholic Bible scholarship where the Catholics are going out. They're collecting what they call these polyglot Bibles, where they got the Aramaic version, the Samaritan Bible. So there was good scholarship. But even to this day, scholars tend to want to keep things to themselves, right? Oh, you get this degree. Peer to peer, they don't talk to the masses, they don't educate the masses. So that's probably the same thing going on. And of course. Certainly, Satan's intent behind it was to keep it from, from us. Yeah, and. and they wouldn't and, realize they're. Right. And in the yeah. Catholic, in the Catholic Church, has his minions. Yeah. there were people in the Catholic Church that recognized this was a problem. Like St. Francis of Assisi, people don't know the gospel, so I'm going to go out and preach the gospel. Or the Dominicans, where they're teaching, doing Bible teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's all, you know, the, the Catholic Church wants to control that, right? Right. Citizens is where my people are destroyed for life and knowledge. Right. And so what did, what did Martin Luther do? He translated the Bible into a vernacular, Right. So he translated the, you know, they still use it in Germany this day, the Martin Luther translation. So you have this movement. So we're not just talking about extra biblical books. I mean, the Bible itself was unavailable. And sometimes people talk about, part of it's just to the times. A lot of people are illiterate. Um, and it's just what it's just, if you want to communicate in educated circles, you got to know Latin. It's just the way it was. Like you said, pride perhaps. But the result, whatever the motivation was, the result is people didn't have access to the Bible. So what Martin Luther doing is doing is a revelation, a, re a revolution, and a revelation, right? Let's translate the Bible into common, everyday German so everybody can, can know the Word of God. And Jonathan's talked about this before. We have uh, the Tyndale Bible, which the King James basically is a, re a revision of that Bible. And uh, 
Tyndale's like, I want everybody to know the word of God, even the boy, the shepherds, the boy pushing the plow in the field. I want everyone. And this was a, you know, a, a new movement. They killed him for it. They did. I think uh, you know, they, they, they burned him at the stake for, yeah. in, in the hall. And the Netherlands, which is supposed to be a more open society. So anyway, Luther is going around, and he decides he wants to engage with the people. And he found out that, you know, like I said, I, I think Enoch, you know, the Maccabees, these things are important. But these people didn't understand the nature of the Catholic Church of people, people and, and he was amazed and appalled that people didn't understand basic doctrine. They didn't know who God was or Jesus was or the Holy Trinity. So he had to, Martin Luther had to write a short book, which is called, uh, I guess it's the Shorter Catechism. <coughs> because people were in such, because of, you know, a thousand years of withholding the scriptures from the common people, people were in spiritual darkness. We aren't talking about extra biblical books. They didn't even know the Bible itself. And that's what Protestantism right. was trying to correct. More Bible-based teachings instead of so-called apostolic teaching, apostolic yes. authority, right. uh, authority as we right. see right. In, uh, in these liturgical churches. We have an evangelical faith, which is about having a personal relationship with God. Because what are they, what, are the, what was were the religious experience? You go into church, you have the smells and bells thing. You go to a long, elaborate service in a language that people didn't understand. You know, it's the same way with Islam today. Uh, the Quran is written in, in an antiquated Arabic that nobody understands. And, uh, yeah, they go through all these. So it's, it's not just something that happened in the Middle Ages. Among Islam, that happens this day. They don't understand the Quran. They don't want it translated. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it is all kind of, it's, instead of having a real relish, uh, a relationship with God, it becomes a ritual and superstition, right? right. But with the Gospels, with the good news about how that you can have a relationship Knowing God is your Father, because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, we went over too long. It's time. Let's transition to worship service. Joseph, why don't you close us out in word for uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for this Shabbat day that we can that we can feast on this spiritual food, Father. It's uh, food for our soul, Father. And uh, man has been in darkness, and and church leadership has promoted this darkness rather than the light that we're supposed to promote father enlighten our eyes in your instructions father let it touch our hearts in love father and just bless each and every one today bless the service today in Yeshua's name amen, amen. amen.